despite you know being a very uh, combat rich battle hard hardened outposts we still a military force we're not a military power and especially after the covid the armed forces were to be asked to do more and more in this this blinking no blink mission right so we did not blink and we did not also do any blink mission what what are counter productive you have to understand the high altitude areas and have a certain long is high altitude the temperatures out there are low but the temperatures are high fast and more the terrorist state if you do verify fast and more the terrorist acts all over the world have a direct or indirect correlation with pakistan hello and welcome to dev talks today i have a very special speaker with me lieutenant general vinod bhatia pvsm avsm sm who retired from the indian army after a 40 year long career distinguished career if i may add he was the director general of military operations one of the most important positions in the indian army his vision and his skills during that time with regards to the strategic arena around india played an important role in forming the policies for the indian armed forces he was commissioned into the parachute regiment and some of his higher command positions include an infantry division on the line of control as well as a corps at the india china border thank you sir for joining me today to talk about the military operations of today as well as the geopolitics surrounding him uh thank you adi and jahan and jahan to all your viewers thank you very much for giving this honor to be here thank you jahan sir so my first question is that india finds itself in a very tough situation today a hostile neighbor on each side a pandemic which is raging wild in afghanistan on the outer circle as a ex dgmo so i believe it would have been a tough day in the office what would you be, your outlook be towards the situation that we are facing today uh yes uh, definitely uh, 2020 is a defining year uh, uh, 2020 we had uh, things have changed since then uh, the world has changed nations have changed societies have changed people have changed individual behavior has changed so you find a lot of the changes basically uh, uh, it is due to the china factor Uh, the coronavirus, the Made in China coronavirus, COVID, uh, as also what China has done on the line of actual control, uh, uh, aggressive behavior out there, not assertive. It is aggressive now. Uh, it has changed the status quo. Uh, it has uh, violated all the norms of the last one and a half decades of Eastern tranquility. Uh, it has violated the five agreements. So, for 2020, I think has been defining year for the basically for the reasons uh, that China uh, has been. Uh, you know, China saw uh, opportunity, as Sunzu says, uh, amidst every chaos, there is an opportunity. Uh, so China follows that. Uh, so we had COVID on the one side in 2020 early. We are doing we are doing rather well on the COVID front, both domestically and internationally. When we were uh, uh, you know exporting medicines and we were looking at India as the pharmacy of the world. And then on uh, early May uh, we had the Uh, Chinese built up along the LEC, and uh, they came and they uh, violated the established norms, uh, making permanent, semi-permanent structures across across the line of control uh, and line of actual control. So that changed, and then things started unfolding. See, uh, uh, geopolitically things have changed. China is not only done this with India; it's also uh, with the, in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, uh, with the Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Korea. Uh, Taiwan, in, in particular, uh, so you see the things are changing. The world order is changing. The political uh, uh, world order is changing, and India sees itself uh, as uh, the pivot in this world order. We, we, uh, in the community of nations, uh, we are a responsible nation. Uh, we are a risen India. We are a responsible, uh, resurgent India. Uh, so that is something uh, which we'll have to live by. And as you know, things shift from the west to the east. Uh, the geopolitical shift is there from the west to the east, and India would be the uh, major factor in that. Would be the deciding factor of uh, the emerging world order. Uh, so that has changed. Uh, in the neighborhood, things have uh, not been very good for India. Let me say that uh, we had uh, uh, in the northern uh, our very two friends, Nepal, which is you know, uh, uh, which again uh, uh, has been drifting away from India and towards China. Bhutan stands steady with us. Bangladesh stands steady with us. We are under 50 years of uh, the 1971 uh, liberation war. Uh, but Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar has been through a major turmoil with the uh, coup. 
uh, coup happening out there. So uh, now we find uh, Afghanistan with a pullout. We have states in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan has, yes, there will be some change in Pakistan too. And uh, we have a quarter LC uh, as of climate control uh, as of end February, as of 25th of February. So we, we see all these changes happening. Uh, as the as the DGMO, you know, every every uh, day in the office is a busy day. Let's say 18, 19 hour working day. So that's not a, nothing new. Uh, but yes, uh, we'll have to look at the neighborhood. We'll have to look at the extended neighborhood. We have to look at the world order. Uh, we are a major player in most of the multi multilateral uh, 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 forums. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, military, uh, which is backing our complex national. That is true, sir. As a matter of fact, we always were a part of uh, the world player or the world game. But it is just that the discussion of us being a part, uh, such a major part of the world game has actually started very recently. So the awareness amongst people is coming out and it's, it's very interesting to see this whole thing spanning out. And I agree with you. The past, I would say, one and a half years has been very, very challenging towards the country. So we also have a huge task coming up in front of the Indian Armed Forces, which is going to, uh, which is being called as the theaterization of the forces. Two of the theaters have been announced. Uh, I wouldn't want to dwell into the ones that are not announced, but uh, talking about the ones that are announced, the Air Defense Command as well as the uh, Peninsula or the Maritime Command. How do you think these moves will impact the reach and efficiency of the Indian Armed Forces? And what are the challenges that you see in this path? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. I also been uh, director of the Center for Joint Warfare Studies for five years, uh, until very recently, uh, uh, end of end of last year, 2020. Uh, you see, uh, let me put it in, a, in, a, in the context. Uh, India uh, has the second largest army, the largest voluntary army. We have the fourth largest navy with, with the Navy. We have the fourth largest air force, very Persian air force. Uh, we put it in Balakot and other things. But uh, uh, despite you know being a very uh, combat rich, battle hard, hardened out forces, we're still a military force, we're not a military power. Right? So uh, that has to be seen in that context. And there are two reasons why we're not a military power. Uh, one is that uh, most of our uh, military hardware uh, is ex-imports. We are not self-reliant in defense manufacturing. So that is one weakness which has been corrected uh, too late, but it's been corrected. And the second uh, uh, reason why we are not really a military power is that we are not integrated. It's, it doesn't mean that we have not done joint operations earlier. We have fought the Sandian war as no one could have. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, task to uh, liberate Bangladesh in about 14 days' time given the delay and the uh, strength out there to combat power. So that um, in Sri Lanka again and Maldives again, as an example, I was part of that operation. Uh, it, was a joint, it was a joint operation, well integrated. But the fact is that we didn't have the former structures and systems for integration. So that is something which uh, has changed since uh, the last uh, one year, one and a half years. As the CDS has been appointed at long last after the uh, you know, government, uh, group of ministers report of 2002, uh, we, we took 18 years to appoint a CDS, a CDS has been appointed. We are looking into integration in a big way. And uh, I think the realization has on, on the three services, the only way forward is integration. Mm -hmm. So we see that happening. And uh, as of 15th August, as you to understand, uh, we are likely to see uh, the formation of uh, the Air Defense Command uh, and also the Peninsular Command or Maritime Command, or whatever you call it. So these two and the others will follow. Uh, so I, 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 I think we are in the, in the right uh, direction, the right trajectory. Uh, the transition will have to be seen. Transition management is not going to be easy. But when it takes place, Fully, uh, we'll see uh, the, the transformation of the armed forces from military force to military power. So, uh, as for the effective concern, uh, we'll have to look at you know everything about parentism and you know decentism. And uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, you know Indian armed forces have a budget, and uh, we, we have to go by the budget, we'll optimize that budget. We can't ask for three percent, four percent, five percent. That's not going to happen. Uh, at the national level, we are competing priorities. We have to understand that. So, we need to optimize the budget. And especially after the COVID, the armed forces are going to be asked to do more and more in less and less. I say that again. We have to understand the armed forces will be asked to do more and more in less and less. How do we do that? How do we achieve that? So we have to optimize our budget and we have to optimize our combat power. So what do we need? We need 
combat effectiveness and we need cost effectiveness. We just can't be combat effective alone. We also need cost effectiveness. And we have to prepare ourselves for we have to be future ready. Now we have to present relevant future ready. When we are future ready, we have to support a driven, responsible, resurgent India, uh, which is seen as a net security provider in the region, uh, which is seen as a global leader, as a global player. So we'll have to support this uh, as an armed forces, as an integral part, essential part uh, of our complex national power. So that is what is changing. There will be challenges. There are challenges. There's no talk about it. There are mindsets. Uh, there are tough wars. Uh, we, we are we are getting over it. Uh, but then every uh, uh, transformation or reforms, there will always be resistance, resistance change. There's a comfort zone of people. Uh, we are very confident in what we are doing. And we're not done badly. We've done very well, actually. If you look at it, uh, we, are, we as the armed forces of the nation uh, have done very well. Uh, we have looked at well, our national interests. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are national interests? The armed forces contribute to the national interests in every domain, uh, not only territorial integrity, in every domain, whether it's uh, uh, disaster relief, whether it's UN keeping, keeping yeah, peacekeeping forces, the combined training of the other, other armies, whether it's uh, global war on terror, you never keep in there, uh, whether it is you know, taking people out uh, or supporting during these COVID times. So we, we have had a share, but an integrated armed forces uh, would be more cost effective and more combined. I agree with you, sir. And as a matter of fact, the roles of the armed forces have enhanced as, as the time in, uh, is changing around us and one can see the contribution of the armed forces during COVID. I'll keep that aside for a moment, sir, but I really want to ask you one question. And this, is, this probably may sound like a very layman's question to say the fact that the theatrization is done, as you said, for better optimization of resources as well as utilization of uh, and becoming, let's in a very simple way, a more efficient organization. Uh, what questions that will come to mind is how is the coordination being done between the three forces today? Because, and I, I don't want to uh, berail the efforts of the armed forces, I actually want to say the fact that the way that the mobilization of the armed forces was done against China is something not, you know, short of amazing. And that is something not uh, us saying it, even the world powers have noticed the fact that the way India moved. So how is it happening today, sir? And are you trying to say that it will become even better? I didn't think you think we, uh, you said it. We have demonstrated uh, uh, an integrated force uh, in 2020. Uh, he, uh, it's very sensitive. The situation along the line of actually control is very sensitive. Uh, I, I would say the line of control. It's not so. I've, I've been a different kind of line of control. I've been a four point line of actual control. So it's very very sensitive. And uh, we have done uh, exceedingly well. We, we got, you know, China did achieve strategic surprise. We, you know, we did not expect China to do what it did. But once we had discerned China's uh, uh, movements at the tactical operation level, uh, anyway, at the strategy level for that matter, uh, we stood up to China and we followed a principle known as, you know, what I, I, what I keep saying, what I say is no, bring, no blinking, no blink mention. Right? So we did not blink. And we did not also do any brinkmanship. Both, both are counterproductive. Blinking would have been, you know, shown a weak India and, you know, China respects strength and China would have you know, overrun us on the places. And brinkmanship also is not good for the China-China relations. You know, we are neighbor, we are large neighbor, Asian Germans, two nuclear armed nations, home to nearly 40% of humanity. So we'll have to look at that in the larger perspective, the larger context. And when we look at the big picture, I think we did exceedingly well by no brinkmanship. And hats off to the armed forces for doing that. And also the political guidance, the diplomatic parties. I'm not saying that it was only armed forces alone. But the face of India was the armed forces on the ground. When we're facing each other, we have to understand these are high altitude areas. And having said long years high altitude, the temperatures out there are low, but the tempers are high. Uh, even a small action, uh, like it happened in Galwan, you know, it could have really escalated into something. Uh, but uh, by Galwan, I, I talk of Galwan is, had Kal Santosh Babu not given it back to the Chinese in equal measure or more measure, we would have seen many more Galwans. Mm -hmm. The fact is that we stood by them, we, we were right, we just said well over with us, we are morally right, principally we were right, and we had a better deployment, an equitable and proportional deployment like the Chinese. So Chinese understood that we meant business, we are not going to be backing down and we are not going to escalate. So both these things are very important. And to, uh, you know, 
one was this deployment Third, second was our uh, behavior of troops the demand of troops on the ground third was galwan giving it back to china and fourth was our qpq or the quid pro quo on the kalash ranges when we occupied the kalash ridge over there uh, uh, on 29th february august so china understood that yes they can do so much and no more so that is what we did and this all integrated we had the navy we had the air force we had the outposts uh, the border roads organization so all uh, uh, everything fell into place and that coordination has been done uh, from within so i i, I see we we can do that uh, integrate theaters uh, as and when they come up uh, we will have definitely some uh, issues of transition management uh, but then we can manage it and we'll be future ready when is the future ready the integration here we will we'll look at multi domain warfare more future wars are multi domain they are multi dimensional Uh, we have a, a strategy uh, of war waging. We have a strategy of war prevention. We have a strategy of war fighting. So when we integrate the commands, uh, the, the theaters, that is, we'll find that we will be much better in our combat power. Uh, we will have much better deterrence, as we call it, and we'll have much better reach and uh, reactions and synergy effort to protect our national interests. Th- thank you for that. Sir. I think that's going to be very reassuring to a lot of us in here. uh another thing i'd like to you know actually it's a very very interesting that that you mentioned no blinking and no brinkmanship and that is something that we saw all through the standoff although the voices in india were very very different the voices in india today also very different some of them said that we lost out to an advantage uh with regards to kerala strain some people actually say that if we've done it before we can do it again and these are separate issues and they need to be dealt with separately we can't uh, put a gun on the chinese head on the kailash rain and ask them to disengage with us in debsan there are two different uh, operations altogether what is your opinion sir see the, the kailash ridge has always been there it, it is nothing new the ridge was always there uh, if it was so important we have to do so uh, every uh, you know uh, action at the operational level is finite in time and space Uh, you you cannot say that okay i have occupied it now for i'll i'll have leverages over china for the rest of my uh, it's not going to happen there 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 there, there is a right uh, uh, leverage which we have in time and space right so the we with china we share a 348 km long country it's all in the uh, all in the mountains so there are many ranges there are many ranges there are many kalash ranges it's not one but we have to understand that what we it is a more of a strategic signal which we sent to china it is not the occupation of kalash ridge no It was strategic signal to China that look, if you can do it, we can do it even better. But after we had done it, uh, we we had to understand that that was that had a finite uh, value uh, uh, at the option level, at the tactical level, after the strategic signal was done. It was better to give a chance to peace and tranquility. We have to live together. And mind you, uh, the escalation has not been uh, even China not escalated. Let's let's face facts. We have not escalated. China has not escalated also. So it is not in the interest of China. Uh, we are talking about war. It's not in the interest of China to go to war. Why should China go to war with India? I don't. I don't understand that. It has to have a reason. There has to be uh, a just a problem. There has to be uh, a you know a particular end state which China is looking at. China is not looking at India uh, as a uh, as a rival. That China is doing a big mistake if it has a war with India because it will have to pay a cost to that. It is not 60 to any more, right? So China has to pay a cost. Why should pay a cost? China is challenging the U.S. For global supremacy, it wants a bipolar world, right? India wants a multilateral world, multi-polar multi- world. See, India is the only country which has openly opposed the BRI, which is the China dream. It's the China, China interest. We are the only nation to openly oppose the China-Pakistan economic border because they are trusted for sovereign territory. Okay, and CP is central to the China dream. So we we have our you know India China relations are uh, are a set of contradictions. We have cooperation, we have coordination, we have you know, shared interests, we have mutual concerns, and then we have on the other contradictions we have conflicts. Border is only one conflict. There are other other areas of conflict also. So uh, there there are issues, and we have we have managed relationship very well, and we have stood firm out there. And I think we should not underestimate our uh, capabilities uh, and our leadership. Uh, at the political level, at the military level, the diplomatic level, well, we we have we have done good well as a nation, and we are a strong nation. We can continue to we will do well as long as we 
and the underlying factors that we have to protect and project our national interests. The China policy will reset, but when we reset the China policy, the only thing is we should not, we should make sure that it is pro India and not anti China. Yes. There is a difference between that. Mm -hmm. we, we have to pro our policy has to pro India, not anti China. We have a, we have a large population of 1.35 billion people to take taken care of. We got COVID staring at us. It is the second wave. Maybe there is a third. Maybe there is a fourth. Maybe there is no no third. But then we we'll have to prepare for that. We will have to look at our, our people. So people are people centric. People are important. So we cannot be focusing all our energies uh, on an anti-China policy. So China has got sensitivities. So we should not say I'm not saying we should not. But the fact is that in the end, it should be pro India. What suits us? What suits our national needs? Very very balanced approach, I must say. And that is uh, it's a very reassuring thing to uh, see a. Uh, center line being drawn in a very, very divisive sort of an affair. When people talk about this, there's always two very, very polar decisions that come out. Appreciate your center line approach. And I think that is the way to go. One has to be very, very balanced in international diplomacy. It cannot be an extreme on either ways. There is a time and place for that. Correct me if I'm wrong, sir. sir? Absolutely, I'll be absolutely right. We will have to look after our address. Uh, we're doing it then. Correct, sir. Sir, uh, you mentioned this and the armed forces' contributions into the daily lives of Indian citizens has been growing day by day by day. One thing that we are seeing is natural disaster after natural disaster is happening around us. And that is probably, um, you know, our bad luck that these things are continuing around us. Even in our neighboring countries, the armed forces have been called in to actually help and, uh, you know, relieve the people of uh, the affected areas. My question is, the armed forces is, you know, to my mind, is a war fighting machine, is a defense machine. Uh, when the armed forces is put into a position of doing disaster management, I'm sure there is a certain amount of planning which is already there for such a task. But how do you think going forward in the future, if the armed forces needs to get called into such situations more often, should the armed forces plan and equip themselves better for handling natural disasters? I mean, uh, you know, armed forces cannot be a one-stop one solution to everything. Let me also, you know, uh, be very blunt about it. Yes. To say that armed forces are there, we are a large armed force, and we have a job to do. After all, we have a land border of 50,000 uh, kilometers. We have a, a coastal line of 760 kilometers. We have internal security issues in JNK and Northeast. We have to train. We have to reorient it. So there, there, are, there are a lot of things which the army is... Uh, what to do to be, to be ready? Our primary task is primary task that I can't be the same. But having said that, let me also say that uh, the armed forces are always there for the nation, for the people of India. So to that, we should have no doubts about it. And because our deployment plan India, uh, we have a deployment plan India. And especially in disaster areas, you'll find army as the first responder. Because, because our deployment out there, whether, uh, you know, I was a Pokemon or second month would happen. Uh, so I, we, we, we just took off when we didn't wait for any any requisitions, any orders. When we were there, right from the word go, oh, Uttarakhand relief. 35,000 uh, people were evacuated uh, when there were no roads out. We, we, we used all our resources, including, you know, every life saved is the responsibility of everyone. And our forces will be there, they will be there for the people. And, and we did that today in the COVID situation, uh, you know, uh, look at what uh, the armed forces are doing. There's never a no. There's no question of a no. There will always be more than willing to come across. That happens because we've got, we've got a, you know, command control structures. We may not have the, uh, you know, we don't practice for it. Let me say, we don't, that is the Indian, which is the uh, chartered for this. We don't practice for this. But we have a command control structure. We have a dedicated, committed, professional force, which is capable of doing what it has to do. So we, we uh, you know, the, it is not, we innovate and we, we do things which are, which are meant to be done. If an oxygen plant has to be put on board, we have an engineer, we have an uh, electrical mechanical engineer and a core of engineers to do that. We have the Navy, who does, the Air Force uh, itself is running. So, so we have the expertise available. We only have to get the expertise right there at the right time and to, to do the job. So like in COVID time, the hospital is established. Uh, our medical staff, uh, hats off to them, the medical services. Uh, we have about 10,000 doctors, literally about 9,000 plus, about 10,000. We have 100,000 uh, uh, additional medical staff, uh, administrative staff, and other uh, staff. So all of them today are, uh, are, are there for the people, and they're doing it 24-7. They're there at it. They've been there for hours and end. Uh, so especially now, uh, the COVID situation, which no, no nation can handle on its own, 
on the just just on the health uh, uh, our, our covid warriors not at all also so everyone has to chip in the ngos are chipping in so people are chipping in you know they're so into gooders in life so they are doing, you know, there's this uh, the big commander satyam kushwa uh, he's running a county group the amount of people you know, you know he's got volunteers about 300 plus volunteers and these are young people they, they go to the hospital irrespective of uh, the risk to them and the families so perhaps talk to them so it is all all over and the armed forces will contribute to particular but but we should uh, now understand we should learn our lessons and we should create and strengthen uh, the ndma the sdma the dma the structures and we should get bricks so bricks uh, there with the help bricks tomorrow sets will be traditional and non traditional so we'll have to prepare for non traditional security threats we should not look at national security we should look at comprehensive national security which is all encompassing so things we'll learn the right lessons uh, let's you know first get over the initial battle then we look at what to do ahead but we should not forget the lessons learned and uh, good for you uh, that you are bringing this out right now you looking ahead so very nice of you and your channel defense talks and uh, hats off to you thank you sir so but one thing i'd like to mention and uh, you know when the people actually see the army on the ground there is a surge of confidence that goes across people say pause aaye hai ab to kuch ho jayega you know that is the general public's view and i am actually on social media and i keep reading uh, you know people talking about it even even the 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 you know people in delhi for that matter and these are these are people not from a very high cadre of life for example but they they were all very happy to see the army doing something and they all connect with the armed forces and that's i think one of the biggest reasons why the call is always given to the armed forces bhai forge aa jao please kuch karo you know and the confidence goes up and everything of that stuff happens so now coming to a little bit on to look out of future before i get on to the geopolitical question that i have for you um we have a huge challenge coming in front of us in terms of modernization of the equipment as well as the infrastructure along with the theaterization that we are doing where do you see that going in the next decade in terms of a couple of things one uh, that you mentioned a, you know a constant threat from china so how do you think see the infrastructure on the lac the mountain strike core and so on so forth developing uh, in the near future sir well uh, i think the mountain strike core was sanctioned uh, uh, the preparations were it was sanctioned verbally on the 17th of july 2013 how the dg was that time uh, we really worked at it and october the sanctions came uh, it was a eight year plan uh, so you know i'm not trying to say anything but the armed forces had uh, and the army had foreseen such contingencies Okay, we always contingency to everything. So, the 2013 I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and eight years, uh, eight hundred take us over to 2021. We didn't prepare, you know, 80 to 85 percent of our combat power would have been there. Uh, but somehow the government, and rightly so, I suppose, we didn't have the uh, wherewithal, we didn't have the resources. Uh, we had, uh, we had a certain relation with China, which is coming up, which is which is what should be. So, I, I suppose we did not go in for the complete raisings of the of the strike force. Actually, modern it is not a modern strike. It's more of efficient forces. You know, modern strike with a colloquial word. Uh, it is more of efficient forces, and uh, that can be very handy now. So uh, uh, we should look at capabilities. Uh, we should look at basically uh, capital in all key areas, not only along the LAC. Along the LAC, we need infrastructure, and we need an in integrated infrastructure plan. Uh, it it cannot happen without that. Uh, and this integrated infrastructure plan. Uh, has to have a defense orientation definitely a security but we also have to look at developing our uh, infrastructure for the for the people out there for the villages for the economic upliftment for the for providing health to them for providing education to them uh, most of the uh, our areas uh, do not have even basic road communication mm. so we'll have to look at a you know, in a very big way uh, we started on 2005 and we're 2021 we have a long way to go on the other side the chinese have a multi model multi dimensional infrastructure uh, based on a railway line based on express highways but they have a, you know, the terrain friction our side not on their side so they have an advantage on there the terrain friction our side uh, so with this integrated infrastructure plan has to be there uh, it has to be uh, you know uh, interministerial multi disciplinary uh, we have our problem because most of these areas are uh, sanctuaries 
and the Supreme Court rulings are there that you cannot touch a sanctuary. So right. we'll have to get over this. If, if, you know, if, uh, I always keep saying, if the Delhi Metro can do what it has done in Delhi, uh, well, it's not easy to do any construction work in Delhi. But Delhi Metro has told everyone wrong. If you can do Delhi Metro, the DMRC can do it. Why can't you do that for six years? So we'll have to do that. Right? We'll have to build capabilities of our ISR. That is our intelligence, our surveillance, and our reconnaissance systems. Now, uh, we should replicate what China is doing. We should know China. I have no this thing. We don't know anyone. And for China, China has along the LSE, they uh, have a philosophy, what I, I call a philosophy. It's not that they say it. I just three R's. What they've done is they build roads, they have reserves, and they have radars. Right? So they don't need to occupy things. So I, I, I have the radars, I have early morning, I have the reserves, so I move and I occupy what I have to occupy. Why, why can't we do that? Why can't I have roads? Why can't I have reserves? Why can't I have, I can't occupy every mountain every, every, every mountain. It's not possible to occupy every mountain, every mountain in, the, uh, in those higher areas. I don't need to. So it has to be uh, done in a very systematic way. And uh, let me say that we are doing it. I'm so, so very glad that after all these years, uh, I must thank China for giving the wake up call. Uh, <laughs> we are doing it. No, uh, honestly. No, uh, you know, it, it could have gone worse. No, every, everything you have to look at the positives. So we we are doing it now. We will get on to it. Our infrastructure is coming a big way. Uh, our deployment is much better now. Uh, the army is uh, ready to go on. But we'll also look at capital in the maritime field because that is where uh, China's uh, strategic concerns lie. And we we need leverages there. We need asymmetry there, and we have it. So we 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 will need. The point is that it is a question of money thereafter. So we will have to build capabilities in the maritime domain and integrate the three services and other essential elements of combat. I agree with you, sir. Actually, we need to be thankful to China. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm of the belief that what we didn't do in about half a decade, we did in six months uh, because of the standoff and our military capability vis-a-vis -vis 2019 to today will be a uh, a huge difference, and this is something I can see in the open source itself. Um, a lot of you know, people laugh at me when I say thank China. Yeah. They are crazy, but the fact is, if you look at it, we have got the things right now, we have learned the right lessons, and we are not going to get surprised in the future. As a matter of fact, they've been telling us to do something about ourselves since 1962, so we've not listened, that's all. <laughs> you know, finally, they've jolted us. I, I, suppose, I suppose 62, we didn't have the resources. Also. Yes, sir. Uh, we didn't have resources. We are a new nation. We become, the, 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 you know, it's very, very. Uh, we are six, it's not six to anymore. We are a strong nation, definitely. So that has helped. That has helped. We, we are a growing fund. Despite the COVID, we have, we are uh, hopeful that economy will get back to the knees. I'm sure it will, sir. Um, sir, I have a last question to you, and it has four simple parts. I'd like you to give a statement on how you see the relations with India spanning out in the near future. Uh, the first one, of course, we've discussed quite a bit about China, but do you think that our relations with China are going to be as strained as are they are today? See, uh, uh, the world is changing. Uh, when the world changes, the, the change is driven by what I say, the balance of power. Uh, so the balance of power is what is driving the uh, emerging world order. Uh, and in the post COVID, we see uh, we'll see uh, the change of the new world order. Earlier, it was bipolar world, the Soviet Union, and now it was unipolar world. China is now emerging. Both China today is militarily, economically, technologically uh, strong. There's no doubt about it. But if it, it's not as strong as the US, so it can't really challenge the US. Mm. But then uh, India has to, what I say, balance of, it'll have to look at balance of power. But India should also look at balance of interests. We should have a very optimal balance between balance of power and balance of interest. We should not get driven away by the big game of balance of power. Mm. We should look at what interests India. If God is of interest to us, I will a member of the board. If RIC, the Russia, India, China, trilateral interest to us, we should be part of the RIC. If SEO interests us, I'm part of the SEO, I'm part of the BRICS, I'm also part of G7 and G20. Okay. So we, we, that's what I keep saying that we have to look at what interests India. So this is the underlying fact is that today India is, we have our soft power, we have our hard power. 
we have our smartphone. We are trusted in the world. We are world civilization. Uh, we have linkages and leverages everywhere. And the world trusts us. The world, world trusts us to do everything. We are the only nation which has gone and on the invitation of like whether it's Sri Lanka, whether Maldives, we went in, we did our job, we came out. So most of the countries don't come out like this when they're big, you know, armies out there. They don't really come out. Uh, look at the US. It has taken a how many years in Afghanistan and they're now going out. So it has taken them a very long time. 2001, 2020, 20 years. Vietnam. So we are, we are not that. This is the Bangladesh. No, we, 14 days and we are out. So it is, it is not that. So we, we have to understand that uh, most of the nations do trust us and that we should maintain, we should invest in the people. In Afghanistan, we should invest in the people. We should not put our votes on the ground out there. No question. We learn from history. We are we not a we, we are not a military nation as such. When must be muscular in many ways. We have the military, but we are not the ones who, you know, uh, who who reach beyond. We have to look internally and we have to take everyone along. So that's what I'm trying to say. I, I look at India, which is again I say a very responsible nation. That is a very responsible nation, a very respected nation. And it's not easy to maintain that. Uh, especially the challenges we have in the neighborhood also, uh, whether it's Nepal, whether it's Sri Lanka, we know what's happening with the Colombo port now. Uh, you know, we'll have to fight, we'll have to uh, not fight, but we'll have to you know, address all these concerns of our neighborhood. So sure. we, we have to look at what the Prime Minister says, Sagar, security and growth, all of the region. Uh, if these are not words. So uh, we, we will have to look at everything, the whole canvas uh, uh, as. Uh, our playground, uh, and we have to take it. Interesting. I think that's a very, that's a very large and a broad vision of uh, things, and I appreciate that. Sir. So, what about the? I think India's favorite enemy was Pakistan, and Pakistan has a big challenge in terms of China. But I'd like you to talk about Pakistan. What's what's going to happen there? We see a lot of instability. No, I, I would, you know Pakistan is a mischievous name. <laughs> right. uh, no, it's a, it's a fact. It's a mischievous name. Uh, we are neighbors. The people are very good. Pakistan people are very good. When you meet them uh, outside, you, you, know, you can relate to them immediately. Because, uh, that's how it is. But it's a mischievous neighbor. It's, it, it follows their policy of a low-cost, high-effect war, which is a proxy war. Uh, it has uh, not reconciled uh, to India's growth. And we are five times larger than Pakistan. Pakistan keeps the uh, you know, top for India. Now, Pakistan army is uh, you know uh, drives the policies of India. It's not the Pakistan government, Pakistani army, especially the India policy. Mm. And the relevance of the Pakistani army is based on an anti-India stance. Right. So, Pakistan army's relevance, whether it's there and they have an economic stake. Uh, economically, they are one of the richest out there. The Koji Foundation, Shine Foundation. Their domestic relevance, their political relevance, is on an anti-India stance. So I, I I do I don't see uh, our relations improving in the in the near to mid term, but I, I hope in the in the mid term people have started realizing the uh, they started realizing that it is not the way to go, mm. and things are improving. Uh, there was a very positive statement by the chief uh, General Bajwa. So let's see how it comes about. But India, on the other hand, has tolerated Pakistan. Uh, we, we should look at a stable Pakistan, not a stable Pakistan. You know, you, you always want to look, you want, want to live in a stable neighborhood. Yeah. A stable neighborhood is good for our growth. So, uh, what we have done now with Pakistan is a very good thing. We have paid it back to Pakistan. The low cost, high effect war has started to a high cost, low effect war. Pakistan understands that. Today, the opportunity is there. Pakistan is in a bad shape economically. Uh, Pakistan not trusted with the world. Pakistan, known as a terrorist state, 50 to 85 percent of the terrorist acts all over the world have a direct or indirect correlation in Pakistan. Mm. So uh, we, we, we see uh, a growing India and a diminishing Pakistan. So this is the time to uh, get put pressure in Pakistan, uh, but it's not going to be easy. Pakistan talks something and does something different. Mm. So, but we'll have to handle Pakistan the way Pakistan is, is not the way Pakistan should be. Okay. So there's a difference in that. Uh, we will have to talk to them. Uh, I, I think I, I, the other day I wrote a piece. Uh, I wonder if someone, some of your audience may have read it. Yes. Uh, uh, that India, the military should drive India-Pakistan peace initiative. 
Mm. Okay. Why I say that is under political guidance, right? For India. And Pakistan, Pakistan drives the peace nation, the Pakistan army drives, drives the daily, the India policy. In India, the military does not, and rightly so, it should not. Uh, but when you deal with Pakistan, it's easier for the military to deal with Pakistan military. So under political guidance, I think, uh, like, like in China, we did that in China. Like, yeah. you know, we have a norms of court wonders talk, and they have unit results. It's not that they don't unit results. The fact that we have, there's been no escalation since Galwan, uh, is, a, is a proof that uh, the talks can take place. I mean, we have the DGM level hotline, uh, which is proven uh, over the years. So we'll have to look at Pakistan as Pakistan is, uh, and not as Pakistan should be. And within that, we have to make sure that Pakistan's, uh, we defeat uh, Pakistan's uh, low-cost habit war, and in the mid to long term, try and change Pakistan's behavior. Mm. Uh, it's not going, there, there are ways and means of doing it, uh, but we'll have to look at Pakistan uh, and our focus can't be China alone, our focus can't be other things. We'll have to look at focus in India and a peaceful neighborhood. Correct. Interesting, sir. And I think I agree with you. The advent of uh, military diplomacy has to be a part of our foreign policy now. There is no way that we can keep the military and diplomacy separate. At the end of it is the same uh, structure that is going to exert our international power. So you mentioned a little bit about Afghanistan. Small question and, uh, you know, just was wondering whether China, China is coming inside pretty hardcore. Do you think uh, we should let it? I hope China does. I hope China goes into Afghanistan. Now, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, from the first Afghan war to the second Afghan war, the British were defeated, the Soviet Union went there, they came out. Uh, we have the Americans, and uh, not that they've been defeated, but well, they got OB and fine, but uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, yes, they, you know, they were, from, from the military point of view, yes, China goes into Pakistan and you vote for the military. China's pension get diverted, the resources get diverted. But I think the geopolitical space uh, will suffer. Uh, because uh, uh, we, we need Afghanistan, we are ministering the people of Afghanistan. And uh, that is something which is very good. If you go to South Delhi, Saket, Malwan Nagar, Lajpat Nagar, double story, you find Afghani you know, shops out there, Afghani restaurants out there. So there's a lot of Ghanis who well come to India for the medical treatment, basically. Uh, they come for the education. So we invested very well in the people of Afghanistan. We should continue to invest in the people of Afghanistan. We, we have uh, done some good projects of uh, projects of Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the Kabuliwala syndrome still continues. We trust them, they trust us, uh, which is not, not uh, very much because you know, Ghanis don't trust Afghanistan at all. Uh, they, they just don't trust them at all. Uh, I have been part of uh, some of the dialogues. And uh, you know, the, we are still civil to them, but the, the Bhanis are totally anti pro. <laughs> of course, they have to live with Pakistan. Mm. So, we we'll, we'll have to look at you know, Afghanistan. We have had a good policy. We should continue with the policy. Uh, and once the US moves out, we should not be in a hurry to fill that vacuum. That vacuum will be there, and there will be a, they, they will be a race to fill that vacuum. But we should not be in a hurry to fill that vacuum. We should keep investing in the people of Afghanistan. In their, to make sure that uh, we uplift them and meet their requirements and their needs, uh, rather than try to impose our interests in the past. Interesting. I, I agree with you, sir. And uh, more and more voices are coming out and saying that. Finally, sir, Myanmar. Um, I find it to be the biggest threat to um, our national security towards the east, uh, especially with Chinese trying to, you know, get inside Myanmar and get one of one of their ports. Um, what do you see happening there, sir? It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's too early to come to, uh, to come to conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very delicate uh, sort of a decision to take. Uh, we are a democratic nation. Uh, we support democracies definitely. But then we as a nation don't interfere with the, the internal matter of the nations. Correct. That's our, that's our philosophy. That's our, that's our, that's our greatness. We have never interfered with the uh, internal the dimensions, internal uh, matters of other nations. We don't like anyone else to interfere with our nation, and we don't do it. So this is uh, what has to be resolved is the internal uh, matter for the Myanmar's uh, people to resolve. Uh, but yes, there are neighbors, so we are indirectly impacted. Uh, we have a 1146 kilometer border with them, uh, with, with, with Myanmar, and, and this border has got a free, free move regime. You know, when I say free movie regime, that means India's and Myanmar people cross over 
uh, 16 kilometers either side without any documentation. So we have a free move regime. It's very interesting, you know. If the people are linked, so we have linkages there. So we'll have to look at uh, uh, Myanmar how it pans out. Uh, again, uh, we should not do anything which is against the interests of the Myanmar people, uh, and we should also look after India's interests, and we should not get in competition with China. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's easy to get in competition with China. China makes a project, we make a project. China do two projects, we make three projects. So that's not that we don't have a team. Firstly, we don't have the deep pockets. China has the deep pockets, and China follows the three. So China follows the three prompts uh, strategy. What it did in LEC, what it put, what it done in Taiwan, the South China Sea. It's, it's part of the coercive tactics strategy or the military coercive strategy. The second thing it does is uh, one border diplomacy, right? And uh, surprisingly, in Alaska, uh, when the U.S. and the Chinese and the Russians met. China very much first. Uh, they had a public spat in front of uh, the media. Mm. So you look at the bull border diplomacy was earlier in India with uh, not India so much Australia. You see European, you see. And the third thing that is the debt trap. What what we see in Sri Lanka, what we see in another nation. So we cannot compete with them. Uh, but all the same, uh, we will have to make sure that China, uh, India, Myanmar relations uh, remain. Nations, and uh, that we don't interfere the internal matters, uh, but then we support what is right. I think you've written this in your. Delicate. Sorry, uh, sorry, sir. Please continue. So it's a very delicate balance. Mm. I think you've written this about uh, about this in your article as well that uh, India has to look at and counter these three, you know, Chinese moves and how to actually balance it out. It's it's a very interesting piece. I, I'd recommend pretty much everyone to have a have a look and read it. So thank you so much this has been a wonderful experience talking to you about uh, starting off with the uh, you know the position of the armed forces to the theaterization we've com- covered up operations we've covered up strategy and uh, to end it all we've covered up geopolitics of the region which is very very critical for our national security today and one thing i think it's a big takeaway from this discussion is india cannot blink and cannot be a brinkman and that is to me one of the most hard hitting points that i have taken out from this discussion apart from loads many others and i'm sure everybody who views this video will find their own points uh, to dwell upon and to do further research on thank you sir for lighting the flame for us to actually think a little more thank you ali thank you thank you ali and thank you to the stocks and jai hind jai hind sir